Section zero of the service. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. The service by Henry David Thoreau. Introductory note. When some twenty years ago there were sent to me from the portfolios of Emerson papers by different friends of ours. I found among them an essay of twenty-two full manuscript pages in the familiar script of Thoreau, tied together with knots of faded pink ribbon, like his college commencement part, but with no numbering of the pages. If made up, as it probably was, according to Thoreau's constant custom, from his journals, the fact cannot be well ascertained, so many of the entries before 1841 having been destroyed or lost more than any of his published writings it displays that taste for paradox which often is found in authors of a singular originality and of such a profound imagination as thoreau had its form was perhaps suggested by the discourses on peace and non-resistance which in eighteen forty were so numerous in new england while the native pugnacity of thoreau provoked him to take up the cause of war and persist in the apostolic symbolism of the soldier of the lord and the middle-aged crusader human life is his topic and he views it with an oriental scope of thought in which distinctions of time and space are lost in the wide prospect of eternity and immortality curiously at variance with this is the play upon words a habit which he never outgrew while his wonderful glances at outward nature always interpreted symbolically of the spiritual life indicate how early and intense was that perception of the aspects of the universe which first and perhaps chiefly still awakened an interest in thoreau's pages characteristic too are his ecstasies concerning music of which he was ever the enthusiastic votary thus in a passage from some journal cited by ellery channing in his rich chaos of selections in thoreau the poet naturalist he says what a significant comment on our life is the least strain of music when i hear music i fear no danger i am invulnerable i see no foe i am related to the earliest times and the latest i hear music below it washes the dust off my life and everything i look at the field of my life becomes a boundless plain glorious to tread with no death or disappointment at the end of it in the light of this strain there is no thou nor i it paints the landscape suddenly it is at once another land the abode of poetry one feels in this whole essay the spirit of youth its confidence in itself its haughty scorn for the conventional and customary a singular blending of the aristocratic and the democratic in its tone towards other men who are at once the dust of the earth and the superiors of the stars youth never forsook thoreau and though he moderated the peculiarities of this essay he never quite abandoned them in his later writing a date was added in pencil by thoreau to this manuscript which written in ink and wholly in his handwriting was sent to margaret fuller then editing the dial in its first year its first number had appeared in july eighteen forty and contained two contributions by thoreau the poem sympathy written a year before and a short essay on perseus the stoic satirist this much longer contribution was held by miss fuller until december first eighteen forty and finally refused in these terms last night's second reading only confirms my impression from the first the essay is rich in thoughts and i should be pained not to meet it again but then the thoughts seem to me so out of their natural order that i cannot read it through without pain i never once feel myself in a stream of thought but seem to hear the grating of tools on the mosaic it is true as mr emerson says that essays not to be compared with this have found their way into the dial but then these are more unassuming in their tone and have an air of quiet good breeding 
which induces us to permit their presence yours is so rugged that it ought to be commanding it appears then that emerson desired its publication yet when it came into his hands it seems never to have been returned to thoreau he did not insert it in the dial when its sole editor and from him it came to me long after thoreau's death what miss fuller says of it had much truth and so had her remarks on thoreau's genius in a letter written some months later he is healthful rare of open eye ready hand and noble scope he sets no limits to his life nor to the invasions of nature he is not wilfully pragmatical aesthetic or fantastical but thought lies too detached truth is seen too much in detail there is a want of fluent music i find in the margin of the manuscript pencilings evidently by miss fuller saying of particular sentences good bella etc there are also half a dozen pencilled corrections in thoreau's hand which i have followed in copying f b sanborn end of section zero section one of the service this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schampf. The Service by Henry David Thoreau. Part One Qualities of the Recruit. Spes sibi quique. Virgil. Each one his own hope. The brave man is the elder son of creation, who has stepped buoyantly into his inheritance, while the coward, who is the younger, waiteth patiently till he decease he rides as wide of this earth's gravity as a star and by yielding incessantly to all the impulses of the soul is constantly drawn upward and becomes a fixed star his bravery deals not so much in resolute action as healthy and assured rest its palmy state is a staying at home and compelling alliance in all directions so stands his life to heaven as some fair sunlit tree against the western horizon and by sunrise is planted on some eastern hill to glisten in the first rays of the dawn the brave man braves nothing nor knows he of his bravery he is that sixth champion against thebes whom when the proud devices of the rest had been recorded the poet describes as bearing a full-orbed shield of solid brass but there was no device upon its circle for not to seem just but to be is his wish he does not present a gleaming edge to ward off harm for that will oftenest attract the lightning but rather is the all-pervading ether which the lightning does not strike but purify so is the profanity of his companion as a flash across the face of his sky which lights up and reveals its serene depths earth cannot shock the heavens but its dull vapour and foul smoke make a bright cloud spot in the ether and anon the sun like a cunning artificer will cut and paint it and set it for a jewel in the breast of the sky his greatness is not measurable not such a greatness as when we would erect a stupendous piece of art and send far and near for materials intending to lay the foundations deeper and rear the structure higher than ever for hence results only a remarkable bulkiness without grandeur lacking those true and simple proportions which are independent of size he was not builded by that unwise generation that would fain have reached the heavens by piling one brick upon another but by a far wiser that builded inward and not outward having found out a shorter way through the observance of a higher art the pyramids some artisan may measure with his line but if he gives you the dimensions of the parthenon in feet and inches the figures will not embrace it like a cord but dangle from its entablature like an elastic drapery his eye is the focus in which all the rays from whatever side are collected for itself being within and central the entire circumference is revealed to it just as we scan the whole concave of the heavens at a glance 
but can compass only one side of the pebble at her feet so does his discretion give prevalence to his valour discretion is the wise man's soul says the poet his prudence may safely go many strides beyond the utmost rashness of the coward for while he observes strictly the golden mean he seems to run through all the extremes with impunity like the sun which to the poor worldling now appears in the zenith now in the horizon and again is faintly reflected from the moon's disk and has the credit of describing an entire great circle crossing the equinoctial and solstitial colors without detriment to his steadfastness or mediocrity the golden mean in ethics as in physics is the centre of the system and that about which all revolve and though to a distant and plodding planet it be the uttermost extreme yet one day when the planet's year is complete it will be found to be central they who are alarmed lest virtue should so far demean herself as to be extremely good have not yet wholly embraced her but describe only a slight arc of a few seconds about her and from so small and ill-defined a curvature you can calculate no centre whatever but their mean is no better than meanness nor their medium than mediocrity the coward wants resolution which the brave man can do without he recognizes no faith but a creed thinking this straw by which he is moored does him good service because his sheet anchor does not drag the house roof fights with the rain he who is under shelter does not know it in his religion the ligature which should be muscle and sinew is rather like that thread which the accomplices of cylon held in their hands when they went abroad from the temple of minerva the other end being attached to the statue of the goddess but frequently as is their case the thread breaks being stretched and he is left without an asylum the divinity in man is the true vestal fire of the temple which is never permitted to go out but burns as steadily and with as pure a flame on the obscure provincial altars as in numa's temple at rome in the meanest are all the materials of manhood only they are not rightly disposed we say justly that the weak person is flat for like all flat substances he does not stand in the direction of his strength that is on his edge but affords a convenient surface to put upon he slides all the way through life most things are strong in one direction a straw longitudinally a board in the direction of its edge a knee transversely to its grain but the brave man is a perfect sphere which cannot fall on its flat side and is equally strong every way the coward is wretchedly spheroidal at best too much educated or drawn out on one side and depressed on the other or may be likened to a hollow sphere whose disposition of matter is best when the greatest bulk is intended we shall not attain to be spherical by lying on one or the other side for an eternity but only by resigning ourselves implicitly to the law of gravity in us shall we find our axis coincident with the celestial axis and by revolving incessantly through all circles acquire a perfect sphericity mankind like the earth revolve mainly from west to east and so are flattened at the pole but does not philosophy give hint of a movement commencing to be rotary at the poles too which in a millennium will have acquired increased rapidity and help restore an equilibrium and when at length every star in the nebulae and milky way has looked down with mild radiance for a season exerting its whole influence as the polar star the demands of science will in some degree be satisfied the grand and majestic have always somewhat of the adulatoriness of the sphere it is the secret of majesty in the rolling gait of the elephant and of all grace in action and in art always the line of beauty is a curve when with pomp a huge sphere is drawn along the streets by the efforts of a hundred men i seem to discover each striving to imitate its gait and keep step with it if possible to swell to its own diameter but onward it moves and conquers the multitude with its majesty 
what shame then that our lives which might so well be the source of planetary motion and sanction the order of the spheres should be full of abruptness and angularity so as not to roll nor move majestically the romans made fortune's surname to fortitude for fortitude is that alchemy that turns all things to good fortune the man of fortitude whom the latins called fortis is no other than the lucky person whom fors favours or vir sume fortis if we will every bark may carry caesar and caesar's fortune for an impenetrable shield stand inside yourself he was no artist but an artisan who first made shields of brass for armour of proof mia virtute me vin volvo i wrap myself in virtue tumble me down and i will sit upon my ruins smiling yet if you let a single ray of light through the shutter it will go on diffusing itself without limit till it enlightened the world but the shadow that was never so wide at first as rapidly contracts till it comes to naught the shadow of the moon when it passes near us the sun is lost in space ere it can reach our earth to eclipse it always the system shines with uninterrupted light for as the sun is so much larger than any planet no shadow can travel far into space we may bask always in the light of the system always may step back out of the shade no man's shadow is as large as his body if the rays make a right angle with the reflecting surface let our lives be passed under the equator with the sun in the meridian there is no ill which may not be dissipated like the dark if you let in a stronger light upon it overcome evil with good practice no such narrow economy as they whose bravery amounts to no more light than a farthing candle before which most objects cast a shadow wider than themselves nature refuses to sympathize with our sorrow she has not provided for but by a thousand contrivances against it she has bevelled the margin of the eyelids that the tears may not overflow on the cheeks it was a conceit of plutarch accounting for the preference given to signs observed on the left hand that men may have thought things terrestrial and mortal directly over against heavenly and divine things and do conjecture that things which to us are on the left hand the gods send down from their right hand if we are not blind we shall see how a right hand is stretched over all as well the unlucky as the lucky and that the ordering soul is only right-handed distributing with one palm all our fates what first suggested that necessity was grim and made fate to be so fatal the strongest is always the least violent necessity is my eastern cushion on which i recline my eye revels in its prospect as in the summer haze i ask no more but to be left alone with it it is the bosom of time and the lap of eternity to be necessary is to be needful and necessity is only another name for inflexibility of good how i welcome my grim fellow and walk arm in arm with him let me too be such a necessity as he i love him he is so flexile and yields to me as the air to my body i leap and dance in his midst and play with his beard till he smiles i greet thee my elder brother who with thy touch ennoblest all things then is holiday when naught intervenes betwixt me and thee must it be so then it is good the stars are thine interpreters to me over greece hangs the divine necessity ever a mellower heaven of itself whose light gilds the acropolis and a thousand fanes and groves end of section one Section 2 of The Service. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. The Service by Henry David Thoreau. Part 2. What Music Shall We Have? Each more melodious note I hear brings this reproach to me that i alone afford the ear who would the music be
the brave man is the sole patron of music he recognizes it for his mother tongue a more mellifluous and articulate language than words in comparison with which speech is recent and temporary it is his voice his language must have the same majestic movement and cadence that philosophy assigns to the heavenly bodies the steady flux of his thought constitutes time in music the universe falls in and keeps pace with it which before proceeded singly and discordant hence our poetry and song when bravery first grew afraid and went to war it took music along with it the soul is delighted to still hear the echo of her own voice especially the soldier insists on agreement and harmony always to secure these he falls out indeed it is that friendship there is in war that makes it chivalrous and heroic it was the dim sentiment of a noble friendship for the purest soul the world has seen that gave to europe a crusading era war is but the compelling of peace if the soldier marches to the sack of a town he must be preceded by drum and trumpet which shall identify his cause with the accordant universe all things thus echo back his own spirit and thus the hostile territory is preoccupied for him he is no longer insulated but infinitely related and familiar the roll-call musters for him all the forces of nature there is as much music in the world as virtue in a world of peace and love music would be the universal language and men greet each other in the fields in such accents as a beethoven now utters at rare intervals from a distance all things obey music as they obey virtue it is the herald of virtue it is god's voice in it are the centripetal and centrifugal forces the universe needed only to hear a divine melody that every star might fall into its proper place and assume its true sphericity it entails a surpassing affluence on the meanest thing riding over the heads of sages and soothing the din of philosophy when we listen to it we are so wise that we need not to know all sounds and more than all silence do fife and drum for us the least creaking doth wet all our senses and emit a tremulous light like the aurora borealis over things as polishing expresses the vein in marble and the grain in wood so music brings out what of heroic lurks anywhere it is either a sedative or a tonic to the soul i read that plato thinks the gods never gave men music the science of melody and harmony for mere delectation or to tickle the ear but that the discordant parts of the circulations and beauteous fabric of the soul and that of it that roves about the body and many times for want of tune and air breaks forth into many extravagances and excesses might be sweetly recalled and artfully wound up to their former consent and agreement a sudden burst from a horn startles us as if one had rashly provoked a wild beast we admire his boldness he dares wake the echoes which he cannot put to rest the sound of a bugle in the stillness of the night sends forth its voice to the farthest stars and marshals them in new order and harmony instantly it finds a fit sounding board in the heavens the notes flash out on the horizon like heat lightning quickening the pulse of creation the heavens say now is this my own earth to the sensitive soul the universe has her own fixed measure which is its measure also and as this expressed in the regularity of its pulse is inseparable from a healthy body so is its healthiness dependent on the regularity of its rhythm in all sounds the soul recognizes its own rhythm and seeks to express its sympathy by a corresponding movement of the limbs when the body marches to the measure of the soul then is true courage and invincible strength the coward would reduce this thrilling sphere music to a universal wail this melodious chant to a nasal cant he thinks to conciliate all hostile influences by compelling his neighbourhood into a partial concord with himself but his music is no better than a jingle 
which is akin to a jar jars regularly recurring he blows a feeble blast of slender melody because nature can have no more sympathy with such a soul than it has of cheerful melody in itself hence hears he no accordant note in the universe and is a coward or consciously outcast and deserted man but the brave man without drum or trumpet compels concord everywhere by the universality and tunefulness of his soul let not the faithful sorrow that he has no ear for the more fickle and subtle harmonies of creation if he be awake to the slower measure of virtue and truth if his pulse does not beat in unison with the musician's quips and turns it accords with the pulse beat of the ages a man's life should be a stately march to an unheard music and when to his fellows it may seem irregular and inharmonious he will be stepping to a livelier measure which only his nicer ear can detect there will be no halt ever but at most a marching on his post or such a pause as is richer than any sound when the deeper melody is no longer heard but implicitly consented to with the whole life and being he will take a false step never even in the most arduous circumstances for then the music will not fail to swell into greater volume and rule the movement it inspired end of section two section three of the service this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. The Service by Henry David Thoreau. Part 3. Not How Many, But Where the Enemy Are. What's brave, what's noble? Let's do it after the high Roman fashion. Shakespeare. When my eye falls on the stupendous masses of the clouds, tossed into such irregular greatness across the cope of my sky, I feel that their grandeur is thrown away on the meanness of my employments. In vain the sun, through morning and noon, rolls defiance to man, and, as he sinks behind his cloudy fortress in the west, challenges him to equal greatness in his career. But from his humbleness he looks up to the domes and minarets and gilded battlements of the eternal city, and is content to be a suburban dweller outside the walls we look in vain over earth for a roman greatness to take up the gauntlet which the heavens throw down idomeneus would not have demurred at the freshness of the last morning that rose to us as unfit occasion to display his valour in and of some such evening as this methinks that grecian fleet came to anchor in the bay of aulis would that it were to us the eve of a more than ten years war a tithe of whose exploits and achillean withdrawals and godly interferences would stock a library of iliads better that we have some of that testy spirit of knight-errantry and if we are so blind as to think the world is not rich enough nowadays to afford a real foe to combat with our trusty swords and double-handed maces hew and mangle some unreal phantom of the brain in the pale and shivering fogs of the morning gathering them up betimes and withdrawing sluggishly to their daylight haunts i see falsehood sneaking from the full blaze of truth and with good relish could do execution on their rearward ranks with the first brand that came to hand we too are such puny creatures as to be put to flight by the sun and suffer our ardour to grow cool in proportion as his increases our own short-lived chivalry sounds retreat with the fumes and vapours of the night and we turn to meet mankind with its meek face preaching peace and such non-resistance as the chaff that rides before the whirlwind let not our peace be proclaimed by the rust on our swords or our inability to draw them from their scabbards but let her at least have so much work on her hands as to keep those swords bright and sharp the very dogs that bay the moon from farmyards owe these nights 
do evince more heroism than is tamely barked forth in all the civil exhortations and war sermons of the age and that day and night which should be set down indelibly in men's hearts must be learned from the pages of our almanac one cannot wonder at the owlish habits of the race which does not distinguish when its day ends and night begins for as night is the season of rest it would be hard to say when its toil ended and its rest began not to it returns day or the sweet approach of even or morn or sight of vernal bloom or summer's rose or flocks or herds or human face divine but cloud instead and ever during dark surrounds and so the time lapses without epoch or era and we know some half score of mornings and evenings by tradition only almost the night is grieved and leaves her tears on the forelock of day that men will not rush to her embrace and fulfil at length the pledge so forwardly given in the youth of time men are a circumstance to themselves instead of causing the universe to stand around the mute witness of their manhood and the stars to forget their sphere music and chant an elegiac strain that heroism should have departed out of their ranks and gone over to humanity it is not enough that our life is an easy one we must live on the stretch retiring to our rest like soldiers on the eve of a battle looking forward with ardour to the strenuous sortie of the morrow sit not down in the popular seats and common level of virtues but endeavour to make them heroical offer not only peace offerings but holocausts unto god to the brave soldier the rust and leisure of peace are harder than the fatigues of war as our bodies court physical encounters and languish in the mild and even climate of the tropics so our souls thrive best on unrest and discontent the soul is a sterner master than any king frederick for a true bravery would subject our bodies to rougher usage than even a grenadier could withstand we too are dwellers within the purlieus of the camp when the sun breaks through the morning mist i seem to hear the din of war louder than when his chariot thundered on the plains of troy the thin fields of vapour spread like gauze over the woods form extended lawns whereon high tournament is held before each van prick forth the airy knights and couch their spears till thickest legions close it behoves us to make life a steady progression and not be defeated by its opportunities the stream which first fell a drop from heaven should be filtered by events till it burst out into springs of greater purity and extract a diviner flavour from the accidents through which it passes shall men wear out sooner than the sun and not rather dawn as freshly and with such native dignity stalk down the hills of the east into the bustling vale of life with as lofty and serene a countenance to roll onward through midday to yet a fairer and more promising setting in the crimson colours of the west i discover the budding hues of dawn to my western brother it is rising pure and bright as it did to me but only the evening exhibits in the still rear of day the beauty which through morning and noon escaped me it is not that which we call the gross atmosphere of evening the accumulated deed of the day which absorbs the rays of beauty and shows more richly the naked promise of the dawn let us look to it that by earnest toil in the heat of the noon we get ready a rich western blaze against the evening nor need we fear that the time will hang heavy when our toil is done for our task is not such a piece of day labour that a man must be thinking what he shall do next for a livelihood but such that as it began in endeavour so will it end only when no more in heaven or on earth remains to be endeavoured effort is the prerogative of virtue let not death be the sole task of life the moment when we are rescued from death to life and set to work if indeed that can be called a task which all things do but alleviate nor will we suffer our hands to lose one jot of their handiness by looking behind to a mean recompense knowing that our endeavour cannot be thwarted 
nor can we be cheated of our earnings unless by not earning them it concerns us rather to be somewhat here present than to leave something behind us for if that were to be considered it is never the deed men praise but some marble or canvas which are only a staging to the real work the hugest and most effective deed may have no sensible result at all on earth but may paint itself in the heavens with new stars and constellations when in rare moments our whole being strives with one consent which we name a yearning we may not hope that our work will stand in any artist's gallery on earth the bravest deed which for the most part is left quite out of history which alone wants the staleness of a deed done and the uncertainty of a deed doing is the life of a great man to perform exploits is to be temporarily bold as becomes a courage that ebbs and flows the soul quite vanquished by its own deed subsiding into indifference and cowardice but the exploit of a brave life consists in its momentary completeness every stroke of the chisel must enter our own flesh and bone he is a mere idolater an apprentice to art who suffers it to grate dully on marble for the true art is not merely a sublime consolation and holiday labour which the gods have given to sickly mortals but such a masterpiece as you may imagine a dweller on the tablelands of central asia might produce with threescore and ten years for canvas and the faculties of a man for tools a human life wherein you might hope to discover more than the freshness of guido's aurora or the mild light of titian's landscapes no bald imitation nor even rival of nature but rather the restored original of which she is the reflection for such a masterpiece as this whole galleries of greece and italy are a mere mixing of colours and preparatory quarrying of marble of such sort then be our crusade which while it inclines chiefly to the hearty good will and activity of war rather than the insincerity and sloth of peace will set an example to both of calmness and energy as unconcerned for victory as careless of defeat not seeking to lengthen our term of service nor to cut it short by a reprieve but earnestly applying ourselves to the campaign before us nor let our warfare be a boorish and uncourteous one but a higher courtesy attend its higher chivalry though not to the slackening of its tougher duties and severer discipline that so our camp may be a palestra wherein the dominant energies and affections of men may tug and wrestle not to their discomfiture but to their mutual exercise and development what were godfrey and gonsalvo unless we breathe the life into them and enact their exploits as a prelude to our own the past is the canvas on which our idea is painted the dim prospectus of our future field we are dreaming of what we are to do methinks i hear the clarion sound and clang of corslet and buckler from many a silent hamlet of the soul the signal gun has long since sounded and we are not yet on our posts let us make such haste as the morning and such delay as the evening henry d thoreau july eighteen forty end of section three end of the service by henry david thoreau